Good morning, folks. We bought an Okuma Genos M660. It has been absolutely awesome. Uh, I want to talk about in this video what this machine is, why we bought it, uh, what we're going to do with it, and then at the end of the video, talk a little bit about what that process was like. Um, if you're thinking about a machine like this, some of the uh, tips and tricks, quirks, and things that we learned throughout this process, but it has been absolutely awesome. Uh, the quick recap of the numbers, it is approximately 59 by 26 inch machine with a 32 tool tool changer and a big plus dual contact Cat 40 15,000 RPM spindle. But what makes this machine really totally different than any of the other machines that we've run and the main reason we bought it is it is a dual column machine. Most CNC machines out there are what are called C-frame machines. And you probably know what this design looks like, even if it's behind, hiding behind a lot of sheet metal. You have your machine base, you have a column, and then off of the column you have your Z-axis that has your spindle in it. This machine is different because it has a column on the left, it has a column on the right, and then the X-axis actually is not in the table like a normal machine, if you will, but rather moves in the head. What is great about this is the thermal stability. And the overall build quality and reputation behind this line is exceptional, but one of the design characteristics of a C-frame is you've got this pretty big kinematic loop. You've got a fair amount of overhang, especially when you get into bigger machines where you've got like 32 inches of wide travel. It's a lot of overhang, a lot of mass. So everything from tool pressure to tram air to for us, we know uh, if we have to open our roll-up door and a gust of air comes through, that's going to affect the temperature of things and the thermal stability really matters. Uh, what's great about this machine is there is no C-frame hangover, regardless of where the table moves and why, but there's no change in the tool pressure difference because it's got that sort of bridge-like design to it. Because we cared so much about the way tooling, in particular face mills, were gonna run on this machine, uh, not only was the big plus important, but we're using big Kaiser, actually it's big Diashova now. Their holders are really nice, and so far that's been absolutely great for uh, getting the results that we wanted to get. What we're doing with this machine is getting absolute exceptionally good parallelism specs and surface finishes out of facing steel for our fixture plates. Ed and I actually drove down to Charlotte last year uh, and spent a day kind of testing the machine out. We brought material, we brought fixtures, we brought our own tools. And what we were able to do just in one day with a showroom machine uh, was pretty awesome. It was a big confidence boost. To be honest, I still wasn't 100% certain it was gonna work uh, as well as it has worked. We brought a MAR indicator with us and we were measuring something like one to two and a half micron uh, step over lines. That was the key here was getting something that gives us the ability to control that process in-house. Uh, because for us, we need to be able to make custom-sized fixture plates. We want to be able to control the general process of quality control and finishes and tolerances in-house. And we want to be able to make matched sets of fixture plates, whether that's two or even more. Uh, and so far, this has been exceptionally good at doing that, which is absolutely awesome. One of the benefits uh, and makes it a bit unique in having a dual column machine is your table only moves in Y. That means your enclosure is way smaller in X and it's really helped with chip evacuation just because there isn't that big of an enclosure area. There aren't that many places for chips to go and the sheet metal that you do have is pitched and sloped such that the chips really do wash down into the augers quite well. Okuma also talks about how the sheet metal helps keep all of the coolant off of the machine frame and the casting to again help improve that thermal stability uh, of the machine itself. To go around to the back, we have a Mayfran Concept 2000. Uh, this is not just any other chip conveyor. It is a dual belt drum style. So we have the first belt here. This is what I'll call kind of the normal belt. When the coolant and chips run down the chute in the machine, they hit that conveyor belt and it carries them up and drops them off into the bin. Again, pretty normal. Then it has a second conveyor right here. It's actually offset from it a little bit and it runs backward. It is a scraper conveyor so it runs this way and it goes down and it scrapes these small particles along the bottom of your tank to keep those fines and other small chips from just living in your tank forever and then for coolant to get back into the tank it has to first pass through a rotating drum filter and inside that drum there's a nozzle of coolant pushing outward and what that means is it agitates and avoids any uh, particles that are kind of suspended like chips or small swarf 
that are suspended in the coolant. It agitates them, gets them out, uh, and they'll probably fall back down in the tank and get picked up by the scraper later. I was pretty sure I wanted this unit. Uh, we care a lot about the quality of our coolant and avoiding any chips that may affect surface finish, tool life, smearing or streaking on a part, uh, things like your rotor unions and your through spindle coolant. Good coolant's a really good thing, um, but what really sealed the deal was Chris Fox, uh, who runs Ignite Digi down in Tasmania, Australia. He didn't have this conveyor on the machine when he bought it, and he realized that it was worth it to get rid of the existing conveyor, upgraded this one, which is a lot more expensive than just buying it the right way from the first time, and that kind of made me realize, okay, I thought I wanted this, that seals the deal. And the other big third-party accessory is a MP Systems. Uh, there's the MP1200, that's a variable mist collector, and below that is the MP Systems 1000 PSI through spindle coolant. One of the things that we absolutely love about the through spindle coolant, it is instant on and instant off. Honestly, the conveyor and the MISC unit themselves both probably deserve their own videos. There's a, a lot of technical detail uh, that I've tried to learn and, and understand because it's really cool to learn. On the flip side, it's in some respects overwhelming. A couple of other fun kind of quirks and, and things that are new to us or unique perhaps to this machine. Number one, it has absolute encoders. There is no homing it. It knows where it is at all times, regardless of e-stop or power cycling, et cetera. So it's kind of cool uh, and actually ties in really well to another feature that I absolutely love on this machine, which is this little Omron timer right here. Now, it was kind of a pain in the butt to program, but it warms the machine up every morning. We set the schedule, the time, and every morning it turns on, it loads a specific program, and because it doesn't need to home a reference, so long as you have, I think, the door closed and air pressure in your shop, it runs its own warm-up routine, which I love because when we get into the shop, the machine is ready to use. Speaking of tool changers, I really like this. You have access to all 32 of your tools while the machine is running right here. It's got its own little control button. You can jog, index it, swap tools out, check inserts, replace uh, end mills, etc. Biggest gripe I'd have is it's really dark in here, as you can kind of see, but quick fix. It's actually a nice quiet Sunday in the shop here. I bought a uh, LED light kind of like what we use for filming, and drilled a little uh, USB bulkhead connector through here, and we'll put a little light inside of there just to make it easier to see inside of there. When we first got the machine, we had like half a day of training, and then they booked a couple of days. We were good. It wasn't that hard or different to use. Uh, there's a lot to learn, and we will have more over time, I think, but uh, the stock Fusion post worked out of the box, which is great. Uh, we've since started using some other posts that we've found or had friends send to us that use uh, some really cool stuff integrating uh, tool life management and spindle loads. We've already started a list of things we want to talk about in another video of tips like that. But one of the things I like is OSP is a totally Windows-based program. We've actually seen folks that have loaded other Windows software on the machine itself. What I cared about was the first thing I saw uh, was an example of loading the file on here with either the USB drive or looking for the file from the control. We mapped the OSP's memory folder to our Fusion computers. So with empty programs, when we post a file, Fusion pushes it directly onto the memory within this. You don't even have to copy the file over. It's right there. Um, there's also a whole API behind OSP. We don't know anything about it yet other than um, the idea that we could tie it into Lex or when setup sheets need pushed through or work orders, the idea that you can have that information come up here in the form of a PDF or a graphic or a web page could be really interesting. OSP also handles all of your maintenance. It tells you what you need to do and when you need to do it, uh, which is great. It's much easier to kind of react to something giving you those instructions. Um, but that also has been a learning curve. You know, there's maintenance type things you have to do on this machine that we're not used to. Uh, the one that comes to mind is there's a pretty expensive like carbide faced pin that doesn't last forever and you've got to replace it. Similarly, we've not had any problems yet, but there's not perfect kind of IO between third party accessories and OSP. So if those uh, have some sort of an alarm or an error uh, conveyor issue or filters full, you should get a uh, error on OSP, but it's not going to be a perfectly robust it may just be a single type of error message. It'll probably be uh, pretty easy to figure out what it is. And I'll give uh, credit to the, both MP and Mayfriend have QR codes, which can let you quickly pull up the requisite manual or service and support information with no hassle. You know, love that. I can't help but think about uh, John over at Area 419 was talking about how 
they, and they're smart guys, they literally couldn't get a machine running one morning because they couldn't figure out what was not happy. Uh, and I think it was something weird where like uh, one of the accessories had a second e-stop or alarm and it was on and they just didn't know what was making the machine not happy. So kind of one of those things that scares you. But again, so far it's been great. The Okuma spec for the foundation was not something that we were going to be able to do, or at least I didn't want to do. The Genos 560, lots of folks have those. I reached out to five people. No one comes even close to meeting the, the actual builder spec. Uh, I don't think that's uncommon. Uh, we've been in this shop for six years. Uh, we know the floor, it's been stable, it hasn't shifted, it hasn't cracked, but we only have five inches. But our game plan was install the machine, level it, see how it runs. Worst case, if we really find that we need to pour a pad, we were gonna cut up a different area of the floor, pour the pad, let it cure for whatever it takes, weeks to cure, and then we would move the machine. But so far, it's been stable. And my understanding is it's not just the thickness of the concrete, but rather uh, the PSI, the rebar, but really what's underneath the concrete. And again, knock on wood, we have a pretty solid uh, foundation or you know, soil or whatnot mix of stuff below our concrete that hasn't settled such that you have air pockets or hollow spots uh, where it would affect the machine. Because again, we really need this to be uh, an incredibly stable machine from a TED tram uh, and an accuracy and level standpoint. Lastly, I really like that it has separate pumps for all the different systems. You can kind of see them hiding back in here. So we have a separate pump for the through spindle coolant. That's pretty normal. But what I like is you have three separate pumps for your hose, wash down, and regular flood coolant. And that means if you want to use one, you're not doing so at the expense of flow or volume from another. So you've got nice adjustable, uh, they move in and out bars here for your wash down on the side enclosure. You've got your regular flood and then the washdown gun or hose itself. We 3D printed a little uh, part here to hold our air gun. Another really nice feature, your override buttons. I like the physical size of the button, but also it goes from 100 to 50 to 10, then five, one and half a percent and zero. Such a nice way to get that fine control that you really all want before you go back up to full speed. We will put a card here to the NYC CNC page where we've got a detailed list of all the build options and specs that we went for on this machine. And we've got that video plan already where we're gonna start sharing some of the things that we've learned on OSP, on code, on posts, and so forth. Uh, we'll keep that updated over on that page. Otherwise, folks, hope you learned something. Hope you enjoyed. Uh, let us know what you wanna see in the comments below. Otherwise, take care. See you soon.